All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the first panel here at the Emerging Markets Venues and Communities for Esports. Now, my name is Stan Press. I got 14 years in the space across games and esports, former competitor turned marketer, partnerships BD guy. I consult and advise on this world and generally very proud to be a part of it and seeing where it grows. Here, because the industry is growing at a rapid pace, Unlocking the competitive experience at a local level is critical to the growth. Here we have a number of amazing folks across three very different backgrounds activating in wonderful ways. We're going to hear how they do it, what motivates them, what excites them, and a little bit more about the future. So real quick, guys, down the line, please introduce yourselves, what you do, and what brought you to eSports. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Greg O'Dell. I'm the president and CEO of Events DC. And for those who may not be familiar, Events CC is the Convention and Sports Authority for Washington, D.C. So we own and operate uh, a lot of the convention and sports uh, venues for the city. And so for us, um, you know, we've just started this esports journey. So I'm proud to say I'm probably the least experienced in esports in this room. Um, but we see it as a huge opportunity for our city as a destination. So I look forward to obviously talking more about that today. John Fazio, CEO of Nerd Street Gamers. Uh, we are an esports infrastructure company. I was a soccer player as I grew up. Uh, I had the privilege of getting to travel the world, had my college paid for, and most of the opportunities that I got in life came out of soccer. While my friends were hardcore gamers, they were CSGO player, CS1-6 players, and they had no upside to the effort they were putting in. They were practicing and training and playing just as hard as I was with no upside while I got to go to college because of mine. And so I wanted to really recreate the types of pipelines that existed for sports, for esports, and realized that the first hurdle was the facilities that can actually provide that level of access to most people. So we set out with the goal of building the facilities to enable everybody in the country to play esports if they want to. Hi, my name is uh, Matt Edelman. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Super League Gaming. We um, are sort of the opposite side of the coin from um, Nerd Street, where we provide content and programming for local esports um, activations and, and competitions and events uh, all around the country, and publish content coming from all of those events uh, through uh, social and digital channels. Awesome, and thank you guys. Uh, to kick things off, I really want to understand what is the driving factor between all of you, why you had to get involved in localized esports. Can we go down the line or just a couple, or if someone wants to start first, just let us know what's, what's the biggest driver. Well, I'm happy to jump in. You know, for me, I was a part of it. Um, one, one six and Call of Duty back in 2007. Counter-Strike 1-6, the five on five game. Uh, Call of Duty back in 2007. I was a part of that community. And so when we, came, when we decided to build facilities 10 years later and really go out and, and kind of reach the gamers that we wanted to reach, we realized you can't just show up in a region and steamroll the local communities. You have to be there to empower them. You have to find and connect with them in unique ways. The FGC community, the fight game community in Philadelphia might be drastically different than the community in Denver. And so connecting on that localized kind of uh, you know, empowerment of the existing communities is, is very important to us because we don't want to come in and tell everybody how it should be done. We want to make it the best for the way that you know, your local community sees it. Got it. Do you guys want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the opportunity in building local esports experiences and local esports brands is to enliven a community and give gamers a sense of belonging to something. And even though there are multiple communities of gamers across fighting games or first person shooters or battle royale games or just a game title that people play at the ab in the absence of really playing anything else, there's a common bond, there's a common link between what they all love to do and what we see is um, the opportunity to have programming that brings gamers together from multiple player pools across any given market. And, and one of the reasons we're able to do that is because we've invested to create both partnerships with um, venues on a local level, including with Top Golf uh, throughout the U.S., as, as evidenced by what we do with them here in Las Vegas, um, and also uh, PC gaming centers, including some uh, run by and owned by uh, Nerd Street. Um, and, and also looking to find uh, local uh, representatives of the gamer community in each market who are really interested in building uh, uh, their local market and the growth of gaming where they live. Uh, that sense of belonging to something is really what drives the attendance to our events, even more so than the desire to compete. 
Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll just offer a little different perspective or lens. And so, you know, we're a city and destination, and we see at a macro level, we're trying to leverage the event experience to actually track people to Washington, D.C. And so, you know, we see esports very similar to a large scale convention or, or even smaller sporting events, and we want to scale that up and obviously have a large economic impact on our city. But we think for esports, we recognize it's a different animal. We can't uh, approach it as if it were a, you know, a convention or any sporting event. We see that it is, it starts at the grassroots with the community and the local experience. And so for us, we even expanded our purview to not even think about just attracting events, but how we can create this ecosystem in Washington, D.C. And so we really go on kind of three different pillars, if you will, uh, one of which is pure and simple about attracting events. The other is focusing on, you know, how can we get our brand into that marketplace, that international marketplace. And so we have sponsorships with NRG and Washington Justice of the Overwatch, to name a few. Uh, but we also have our investment in the local community, whether it's Boys and Girls Club or whether it's uh, working with the universities for lots of meetups and doing local activations. And so we see this as a long-term play and investment for us. So I think local means many things to us, but I just wanted to share that perspective. Yeah, and I'd love to give Greg credit there too for um, some of the local activations they've done. We actually worked together on the Boys and Girls Club uh, activation, which FIFA and Madden was played and gave people an opportunity to showcase their talents and yeah. be broadcast. And, you know, it was Events DC that put that together and brought us in to run it. Thank you. Well, let me give credit back. So I appreciate <laughs> it. It's very great, and we look forward to doing more. John. Just Thank so Matt doesn't feel left, I'm going to give you credit for something. <laughs> Take it. I'm good. And Matt's yeah. a great guy. We're going to do a lot of stuff together, too. We so, are. That's my credit. Well, I love this all because when we're thinking about building up local communities, what in your eyes and experience comes first? Is it picking the city? Is it targeting the game? Help us understand a little bit about that. Well, so far we're in about 35 markets around the country, um, and there are a few considerations uh, that go into looking at what makes a market a viable place for Super League to bring our, our content and our programming. Um, one uh, is infrastructure, so are there places where gamers would want to come play and have a great experience um, as, as players and, and, and that can span sort of their interest in being competitive and also socializing? Uh, another is, is it a college town? Uh, there are obviously a uh, higher percentage of players among college populations than the population at large. So if we're able to draw from colleges and universities, that usually helps attendance uh, with our events. And then the third is, can we um, have confidence that there are local leaders in that community who want to embrace the idea of organizing players um, with Super League as a, as a supportive um, provider of experiences, content, resources? Uh, and those are really, you know, the, the driving factors for us. Um, and so far, you know, it's working well in those 35 markets. Some work better than others. Uh, some uh, demonstrate that, you know, there's a community that's more vibrant for one game title or a series of game titles than others. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the exciting thing is what's what's coming over the next one to two years that's going to sort of open up additional markets and a lot of that has to do with technologies um, like 5G and the ongoing growth of mobile gaming as a competitive platform. Um, so that, that's very exciting for us and really expands our ability. We even operate um, Pokemon Go uh, competitions or, or really social um, uh, gaming experiences in outdoor spaces uh, now. Is it a little so, cheaper to run mobile events? It is. Uh, it's, it's cheaper, there's less friction, um, but there are, surprisingly, even though there are so many mobile gamers, that community is, or that population is spread over an in, in, insane number of games. Um, there are a couple standouts, Clash Royale, which is the, the title that is, is being featured in our tournament tonight, um, is a great example. PUBG Mobile, another great example. We're going to be starting um, uh, PUBG city events and city competitions um, soon. Uh, but, you know, mobile is still, it's hard. If you think about mobile, you can play a mobile game in 10 minutes and you can finish your session and you can be anywhere. So the appeal to go to a centralized location where you're going to be with other people is a little bit different than when you're playing a console game or a PC game that takes you 20, 30, 40 minutes to finish a match and, and going somewhere for that extended period of time and really investing in that match feels a little bit more natural still. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. And uh, 
Uh, yeah, Matt did a really good job covering it. Um, obviously, so we have three facilities in Philadelphia, Denver, and Huntington Beach between 10 and 30,000 square feet. Um, we also have seven mobile trucks, and each one of these mobile trucks has 65 game stations on it, a production uh, booth, and we use it to deploy all across the country to create pop-up esports arenas. Right now, we're working with Kellogg's to run 40 different Overwatch and Fortnite events all across the country using these pop-up trucks. And so, for us, when we select a community and decide this is somewhere we want to be, it's really about history. For you know, in Philadelphia, I lived there. That's why we built it there. In Denver, uh, we found that there was a really history community there. There was 20, 30 years old in FGC, in in um, Counter Strike, and and various other games that had developed. And once we got there with our mobile trucks to run these kind of pop-up events and test out the market before we deployed permanently, we found that there was a lot of champions. And so for us, it's about those champions. Uh, our third location in Huntington Beach, there are a number of champions there running very strong, old communities. And really, the only thing that's holding them back is the lack of infrastructure to do more. And we come in and give them that infrastructure. So let me jump in there for a second here, because you talked about testing a market. How do you test a market? How do you filter that out? Because you have a list of markets. You think you'd look at all the biggest cities by population, but that doesn't always work, does it? No, not at all. You know, so for, for us, it's density of gamers. Uh, you know, we're in our industry, we, or in our business, we don't want to convince somebody to play video games. We want to convince somebody who plays video games to be a competitor. And so when we show up in one of these markets, we don't, you know, in order to test it, one of the things that's hard is you don't want to just draw the same crowd to every new city. And so if we're just rolling around and everywhere we go is the same group of people, that's not not really developing locally. Um, and so what we do in, in testing is really try to market directly to that community, try to exclude the regional marketing that might bring in the, the usuals, and to really promote locally on a small scale to determine who comes out. Uh, the other thing that we do is we go on Facebook, we find the gaming communities on Facebook, we message them, we ask them what they need, what can we do for you, what, what kind of equipment would help you, uh, and we, we reach out in advance and try to find as many of those kind of influencers as champions as we can. Awesome. Now, speaking of when it works out, it's great. But what happens, and how do you react when it doesn't work out? I, I got a great example was uh, San Diego for us. You know, so we had really strong ambitions of going to San Diego. We showed up. There's a really strong community just north of San Diego in Oceanside and Orange County, as some of the other groups here will know. Um, and San Diego just didn't have the developed market, and we couldn't find the champion. So when we ended up running events there, it just didn't have the same type of pool without having a champion. That failure taught us how important it is to have that champion, and that's ultimately why we decided on Huntington Beach was because that's where we found the storied, history communities. I'm glad you didn't say Washington, D.C., by the way. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was going to actually ask you, Greg, what would happen if it was a little tough for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, can, I, can I just, I want to just quickly riff off what Matt and John had, had mentioned about your previous question. So, please. I think for us as a city, like our job is to answer that call, right? So, I think we want to make sure that. Um, when people are coming to either test our market or jump in with both feet, that we provide every means possible to actually bring either that event or that experience here. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's funny, when I first started, or when we first started, you know, we were talking to different organizers, and you know, I found out very quickly that no one was making money in this business. And I would always say either everyone was telling consistent lies or it's actually true, because we found out that you know, there's a level of investment that's required. And so for us, it's not just about whether we have the venues that are available, but we actually have to think about whether we're willing to make an investment and take the risk with people who are coming to our city. So that's just something that we've decided we're gonna make a long-term play of this. And so that's one aspect of the call. The other call is for us to make sure we're connecting the dots. Like, you know, to John's point, you go into a market, whether it's, you know, dealing with our hospitality community or dealing with others, like we have large-scale conventions that happen in our convention center. There's no reason why we can't connect the programming. So as an example, we have AwesomeCon, which is a Comic-Con that we have, or we have Otakon, which is a Japanese anime event. There are tens of thousands of people who come to those events. We need to make sure that we're making esports part of that experience and so that there's a broader appeal to, to that base that actually broadens the esports fan base as well. And so those are the little things that we can do. And it's endless, I could speak forever, but we're not gonna uh, be successful in all of them, but those are things we're willing to do and make that investment, whether it's monetary or otherwise. 
And, and you know, having the cities involved in this way, you know, in our, our event in DC was tremendously successful. It's our next geographic target for building a local host. Um, having the city involved is just so important because one of the things that we forget right now is that esports is an industry of privilege. This is an industry where it is very expensive to compete and participate. It's an industry that's not available to the lower half of our economic participants in our country. It's not accessible to a lot of people. And for us to fix that, we need facilities like the ones that you, you know, we build and you're going to hear other people talk about here. And that, those facilities have to provide integrity, right? You know, so from, from sports, you know that you're going to play on the same basketball court. You know how it's a 10-foot rim. You know exactly what you're getting. With esports and facilities, as plenty of people in this room know firsthand, you get a very wide range of those types of facilities, and the integrity is lost when you don't have that standardization. Cities that come in and empower us with both the capital and the access to the relationships and tourism groups and uh, you know it, the, the various economic development groups, it's essential to building that baseline that will enable more people to access this industry because right now it's not open to most people. I just want to talk about a, a component that's really important to us as well um, and I, it, it's similar in, in spirit with a, a slight tweak. So accessibility is, is so important um, and the way that we think about it is eSports is really representative of a, uh, a cultural phenomenon. If you think about what's happened over the course of, of digital history, which is not that long, it started with the information age and suddenly information was accessible at your fingertips, it moved into social and then connectivity sorry, through digital was accessible at your fingertips and it's very recently moved into creativity. And now you're looking at a, a really a, a generation, a couple of generations who are um, creators by nature. And the origination point for many of those people is gaming. When they get a screen for the first time, they're playing a game and by playing that game, they're actually creating their own experience with that game and the media that comes out of that, whether they're showing a parent or a friend or posting it online, is something that is their own, even though it's part of an intellectual property known as a game title. Um, and, and sort of where that leads us in the way that we think about programming and making esports accessible is it's not all about, and this is the slight tweak, it's not all for us about turning a gamer into a competitor, although that's a huge part of, of what we do. And, you know, we have, like uh, um, uh, John has, we've had players who've participated in Super League and become pros. Um, uh, in, and, and been drafted by pro teams. Um, but it's also about creating that opportunity for social connectivity and social gaming experiences that bring a person who's experienced that creativity younger in life into an environment where they can experience connectivity and, and new relationships and the positivity that comes with that um, in person um, in all of these different ways. So just as a small example, you know, we're running a competitive uh, Clash Royale tournament um, this evening. Part of the experience, anybody who attends this evening will be able to go up to a, com uh, a table that we have set up, download one of uh, three mobile games that are incredibly easy to play and probably are on most people's phones if they play any games at all. And we're going to have challenges for everybody to participate in where you can win raffle tickets and, you know, maybe leave with a, with a great prize. It's about combining the social opportunities and the social connectivity that um, is really at the core component of where gaming gets started for most people with that competitive experience to broaden the accessibility and the appeal. I really appreciate that because this goes into my next question, particularly around the impact you've seen over time. Because each of you have done local events now for one or two, th maybe three years. Can you speak to some of the cities that have benefited from your sustained involvements there? Well, you know, the first LAN event we ran was five years ago, I think, almost, yeah, just over five years. And there were zero high school teams in Philadelphia. There were zero college teams in Philadelphia. Now virtually every college in Philadelphia has an eSports varsity program. There's 15 varsity. Validated by the school? Absolutely. Yeah. And there's uh, 15 varsity eSports high school programs in the Philadelphia School District. Most of those teams use our facility as their home facility for training and practicing. And the universities use our facility for um, 
training, recruiting, coaching, showcase matches, etc. So, you, you know, if you talk to any one of them, I'm not, we're not going to take credit for the growth of all of those. You know, this is an industry-wide growth metric that we're seeing, but they've been empowered in a major way by having this type of facility. Um, I, I think, you know, you had kind of asked before about the opportunity and, and maximizing it's the, the name of the panel here. And, you know, I think w what Matt's uh, done so well and what we're, you know, kind of uh, doing that's very similar is taking these localized communities and providing a scale to it. So if you take 40 local communities and put it under one platform, you've now provided scale to that local community and those local communities by connecting to a scaled platform have access to opportunities they wouldn't have locally or individually. So you know, I think the ability for local communities to find that platform to connect to the other local communities is essential. Uh, you asked, just to, to answer your question, our city versus city league, uh, which is sort of the premium competitive program we offer. It's called City Champs and we do it for a number of game titles. We have seen uh, populations of gamers come to life in ways that you would never have expected to see outside of a traditional sports field. Um, and that happens in a movie theater or in a top golf or wherever players are based and you have the players in New York playing against the players in LA or the players in Las Vegas playing against the players in Denver. Um, and are so there any rivalries that you've seen go really strong? Uh, absolutely. Um, in League of Legends, uh, there's a, a pretty intense rivalry between our Chicago team and our Seattle team um, because they've ended up towards the you know uh, finals of, mm -hmm. of the city champs uh, tournaments a couple years in a row. Um, and then there's sort of natural rivalries that even though you think gamers don't pay attention to traditional sports, they sort of, by extension, get some of that rivalry sort of baked into who they are. So New York and Boston don't like each other. <laughs> Um, things like that. Uh, Greg, you want to add to that? Yeah, we've you know we kind of measure success in a couple of different ways based on the pillars I described. And, and as I said, you know this is a long-term play, so I, I can't speak to the millions of dollars that we've made. So that's certainly not the case. But you know, first starting with the community, we have been absolutely blown away about the community that already exists in Washington D.C. Um, as an example, when we had the Washington Justice Overwatch party that we sponsored, the line was wrapped around the building. Uh, we've been able to host already a couple events. We've gone from smaller scale to now moving uh, to events and we've had lots of interest for our new entertainment and sports arena that we just built, which we built by the way in the mind to be flexible to accommodate esports events and so we've seen lots of interest there. But I'd say probably is equal in validation is that we were um, afforded the opportunity to work with the, the then potential owners of the Washington Justice when they were actually speaking to Activision and help them with that pitch. And Activision, as sophisticated as they are, knew the demographics of Washington, but they gave a lot of credit to a lot of the effort in our business plan and what we were doing in that space that you know, was uh, a part of their decision. So great validation for us, and they're also gonna play some of their home games in our new arena as well. So let's actually talk about the new venue for a second. What is it, what is it currently called? So it's the Entertainment and Sports Arena. Yes, it's a very long name. Uh, we will probably change that, obviously, when we strike a, a naming rights deal. But we did it um, for a couple reasons. It was intentional to put it in an area of Washington, D.C. that had been underdeveloped and underserved, but also was a combined building, one of the few of its kind, that it's a 4,200 seat arena that accommodates different uses, but also um, is a training facility for the Washington Wizards as well. So uh, we're very excited because we know it's going to be a catalyst for redevelopment, but arguably a lot of the programming is going to be new and also uh, conning uh, edge programming, which we think esports fits very nicely. And so we've marketed and programmed as such, um, but we welcome obviously lots of opportunity to host a lot more event experiences and particularly esports. There as well. well. This goes to actually another question about brand involvement because a lot of brands want to access the local communities in a lot of ways that's similar to how they activate in other areas or more traditional areas. Can you each speak to a little bit and quickly because we want to get through some of the questions we're going to be going up on time soon. How brands currently activate with you? You know, so this was actually the reason that you know I'd always wanted to do this. Uh, I, I put a business plan together in 2005 called Digital Gaming Arena, but what actually pushed me to do this in 2015 um, was, was I appreciate big, you sticking it out. <laughs> was the big brands. Um, I was a, cons a software engineering consultant. We did work for Fortune 500 companies, and I can't tell you the number of companies we'd walk into and hear what's going on with gaming. You know, what's going on in esports? How do we get in there? How do we you know activate there? And you know, we'd break it down for them, and we you know, give them the lay of the land, and they got fragment. 
fragmented, it's not developed, it's lacking in infrastructure, it's infantile. And I said, you know, if I were able to offer you, hey, say, 10 cities on a turnkey, you know, platform, would that be appealing? Yes, that's appealing. And now, you know, 10 years later, we've proven it with the Kellogg's deal that was, you know, recently announced. Um, but those brands are really desperate for accountability and integrity that they're used to from other industries, especially traditional sports. And so our ability as an industry to kind of step up and meet that level of integrity and accountability that exists elsewhere is what is absolutely essential right now. And I think, you know, we're starting to see groups and companies, that, you know, kind of surface to the top that have been able to offer that level of integrity. But once it's there, it's plug and play for these brands. It's very much the same as all the other types of activations they do. It's just that there's so few opportunities to do that at scale. In esports, a couple of them sitting on the stage now. Um, but, you know, that is what I think will be most appealing is those scale opportunities for brands. Just quickly, from from our perspective as a as venue owners, you know, obviously we defer to um, our customers and clients who bring that content with us. But in some cases, as I mentioned, we actually co-promote or produce those events, and so we're able to leverage, frankly, some of the relationships that we have that may not be in the space yet, but certainly uh, we can speak and educate them on the growth of esports. So that's very appealing to them. And then similarly, from a venue perspective. You know, we're in the market right now looking at strategic partners and naming right partners for all our venues, but also can scale across our platform. And so, obviously, esports um, as content for them has been very appealing. So, it's something I think we're going to be able to leverage very quickly. So, when you're speaking to not just the brands, you also want to talk about your audiences. Can you speak to, real quick, any of the demographics of what you've seen locally? Well, I can give you a uh, sort of a combined answer. So, so with us, um, brands definitely appreciate that local experience, that, that high engagement um, opportunity when you're in a venue and you can really surround a group of players with your brand in a way that still feels authentic to the player experience, which is ultimately the most important. A brand that comes into this space that doesn't figure that out is not going to have a very um, promising result. But what we also have found is that um, the reach um, that you need to provide to a brand to really get a, a, a marketer to step up with meaningful dollars is ultimately quite important. And we've, really, we've purposefully grown our business to achieve that through digital and social properties we've brought into the Super League fold, either through partnerships or acquisitions. And, and the reason um, I mention that is uh, when you're able to provide that sort of local, physical to digital connection for a brand, um, then we do start to see a brand getting excited about being in a particular city, um, in addition to having reach through digital and social platforms. Um, when we only are able to bring a brand, whether it's because of their available budget or because of the type of experience they're looking for, when we're only able to do something locally, we find it to be something that doesn't repeat as, as reliably as when we're able to bring a brand both that local experience in a physical environment and then tie it to digital and social scale. So you'd ask about the demographic. Um, you know, we see what everybody else here sees, young boys and men uh, is the pr predominant category. Um, an interesting one for us was our Overwatch watch parties uh, were predominantly female, and that kind of was, it was a little bit surprising to us. But the one thing that, you know, bothers me is that it's not a very diverse demographic. Uh, you know, and I mentioned economic participants and economic class a couple times here. Uh, you, your demographic is very very middle class and the ability for somebody you know in an urban low income environment to participate here doesn't exist yet and so when it comes to the demographics that's really our focus is on changing that and increasing that diversity. No, I appreciate that. Now because we're going to have time for questions in just a few minutes there's a couple of other quick things I'd love to ask about especially when you think about each event how important is it to broadcast the event and how do you balance the effort of the broadcast to the effort you put into the live event? That's a great question, and I think it's a little bit of a misconception, at least from our perspective. Um, if you think about um, watching a full baseball game, um, you can watch uh, 
the best team in the league, the New York Yankees, play. Um, or you can watch um, a college team play, or you can watch a high school team uh, down at the local you know, field, or maybe go to a Little League game. Um, if you're just a general baseball fan, you don't happen to have a relative playing in any of those, what are you going to want to watch? Unless, you're just, unless you hate the Yankees. You'd watch the Yankees. Um, and, and I think that's really what's happening in, um, in eSports. The significant viewership occurs at the premium level of competition or with streamers who are the most entertaining. Um, it is not a, an easy um, task to get millions of viewers or even hundreds of thousands of viewers to watch an amateur competition. Um, we've had a, some success doing that a couple of times, but it's really by the good graces of partners like Twitch who happen to like what we're producing and give us uh, a, a lot of promotional support because they appreciate the production value and the effort that companies like ours and John's are making to promote diversity and positivity for an amateur community. So. The event experience ends up being the primary focus. The uh, live streaming experience ends up being um, a nice to have, but what really works um, that ties the whole thing together is the content that we extract from that experience, both the physical experience where we're talking to players, getting to know them, telling the player stories, having them share their love of gaming and using that content um, across social and digital networks and also taking gameplay highlights out of that. If you think about gameplay highlights, if you watch a gameplay highlight on Instagram, it's effectively indistinguishable whether that came from a top player, a streamer, or somebody you've never heard of who's playing in their room um, at home. And so gameplay highlights have been a really exciting source of audience growth. No, for that us. just gives me hope for my own content on my own Instagram. <laughs> and that's it. You know, so for us, uh, unlike most of the you know, major major event companies, uh, eighty percent of our revenue is from tickets. You know, we're, our business model is focused on um, putting the competitors, uh, you know, in in seats. And so the stream monetarily is not that big of a priority for us, but it's an extremely high priority for the customer because they use it as a means to showcase their talent. And you know, so we talked about our core tenets of, of why we exist here. Um, for us, it's access, integrity, and opportunity. And that opportunity side, uh, if you are trying to get into college, if you're trying to get recruited by Rect Global or whoever it is, you need those you know, showcase uh, opportunities. And not just playing at home in your room and practicing and laddering, you need to show that you can play in person, face to face with your competitors and, and perform. And so for our streams, it's much more about showcasing and documenting that talent. We find that a lot of our views come after the live event and the on-demand sometimes get more views than our live stream do because it's more about finding out what that cool thing happened, but we might not have the appeal that, say, uh, Overwatch League does for mm -hmm. viewership. So because we want to throw in some questions, I want to ask one quick last one. Can you speak to some of the better ways that you can monetize? I'm not going to ask for specifics, even though I'd love if you could tell us all those things. But if you could help us understand what are some of the core points of revenue for these kind of activations? You know, I, I can't speak for everybody here, but for, for me, um, what was most important for us was recession proofing and being prepared for liquidity pullbacks. This is a really exciting industry. There's a lot of cash flowing around. Everybody's excited. Sponsor money's flowing. Um, but for anybody who was alive in 99 or 2007, 2008, remembers what happens when that liquidity flush comes and sponsorships dry up, they disappear. Uh, and so what happens is people flock to affordable services. So for us, tickets, access to the best possible gaming machine that you can have at an affordable affordable rate is recession proof. During a recession, you're not going to buy a $3,000 computer. You're going to come to our facility to use it. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on a sustainable model that, that, that put that access revenue first. And then once we got to scale, you open up new opportunities. Now, like Kellogg's, which I've mentioned a couple times, we have retail partners that wouldn't be interested in selling in one of our facilities. But when we have 10 different cities to activate selling their clothes, their merch, their equipment, they're very you know, you know interested. So right now, now our focus was on the, the ticketing side, but at scale, we you know plan to transition heavily to the retail services side. 
Got it. And super quick answers from Ed. Anyone else you want to add? Uh, it's what you'd expect, and it's it's you know maybe we a slightly different balance, but we you know we have registration or venue or ticketing fees. We have a lot of brand partnerships. We do sell a small amount of merchandise, and because of our digital and social scale, we also have brands who are looking at our targeted audiences as uh, great customer acquisition opportunities through digital advertising and sponsorship. Just quickly, different perspective from our side of, you know, obviously we'd love to make money, but it's more about um, having the, the events have the impact on our destination. So success in the future looks like, you know, having uh, sustainable events come to our venues, but more importantly, just as any large scale convention or sports event comes to our city, we're driving people to our hotels or restaurants, and we'd love to see eSports one day doing that as well. Awesome. Do we have questions in the crowd? Anyone want to raise their hand and ask something? All right, we got two people. We'll start with you. Um, we're going to get you to the mic in a second, but if you could please uh, say your name, where, you, uh, where you're with, and super, super quick question. Uh, well, hi, my name is Justin. I'm the owner of Game Arena. Um, my question is more directed to John and Matt. Um, when you're building communities for games like Overwatch or anything that's like five players, like, how do you, like, build those teams? Because most people don't have, like, you know, four friends that all play together at the same level. And then when they come out to a tournament, they get smashed by, like, one of the better teams, and they typically don't come back. How do you deal with growing those type of teams and stuff? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, so for me, we got a real wake-up call with Overwatch because we came from Counter-Strike, which had 20 years or, 50, at the time, 15 years of developed history and teams and amateur systems. Um, and so when we threw tournaments, teams came. When we threw an Overwatch tournament for the first time, we had hundreds of people saying, I want to play, but I don't have a team. And it was a new paradigm for us to figure out how do we source these teams, how do we put these things together. So we had to get creative. We created an academy uh, which runs weekly boot camps and players can come out and train and practice together and hopefully lead towards forming a team. Uh, we run smaller 3v3 events, which is a little bit more com you know, easier and digestible to get two friends together to come out and play. Um, and then the, the boot camp focus is really on as soon as you get there, you know, what is your goal? What is your objective? And sorting you into a place where other people with aligned objectives are there and then, you know, incentivizing them to be on a team by throwing a tournament where they can win some cash prizes from it. Cool. Let me get another question in. Uh, Neil Johnson, MGM Resorts. My question is for Matt, and uh, I mean for John, but Matt, you can jump in as well. Uh, Matt, you had mentioned a couple times about accessibility and socioeconomic uh, factors that kind of limit or, or allow that. And um, here at MGM Resorts, we host EVO every year to find a game championship. So I wanted to see if you could speak to, does the FDC community um, have the best route for access and diversity? Or even, Matt, you had alluded to um, like uh, mobile games games as well, but do those opportunities present the best um, avenues for diversity and access, or do you see some other genres coming online? No, I think I you actually nailed it. I mean, the FGC is a great uh, grassroots community in um, in gaming across the board, and you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is to um, provide opportunities for players to participate in competitions for free. Um, we don't always require them to um, pay to participate. We don't always um, work with a venue partner that uh, has an hourly rate attached to gameplay, and, and that opens up accessibility quite a bit, and we can do that um, largely because of the support of brand partners. Uh, and then what I was talking about before, which also kind of connects to the prior question, is it's also about event uh, format and competitive design, um, whether we achieve that through technology or through the experiential design of what we bring to market in a mobile environment where people can come in and even with lower end phones participate um, with a game that isn't necessarily a big eSport, you open up the potential pool of players who can enjoy that experience. Um, and so uh, those are the things that we look at to try to be more accessible and diverse. And, and you know, John, sorry, super quick answer because I want to sure. get one more question. Sure. You know, the reason FGC is so accessible is because it's the most affordable. One console, six people can play on it, four people can play on it. You don't have to go out and buy the equipment. The more that we see the equipment side of things lower, the more we'll see that. It's also a 1v1. You don't have to go organize teams. You don't have to be a part of something else. You just show up by yourself and can play. And so the more games that can offer that same type of you know opportunity, we'll see that accessibility too. And we have uh, room for one more question. Hopefully something for Greg who doesn't feel too left out here. That's okay. No? I can run my mouth anyway. Uh, let's do it. One more. Oh, right over here right in front. 
raise your hand one more time so she can come give you the mic. Uh, Damaris Hollingsworth, uh, architect. Um, quick question, I think all of you can, could pitch in, but uh, the, the connections of the social, economical, and even uh, the providing of economic mobility through gaming has been quite a bit talked about. Um, and I wonder if you guys have ever done any partnership with it connected to the education uh, part of it. Like a lot of kids from underinvested community, under communities, they have a lot of untapped talent. And, and I always joke that kids are born with the built-in talent for gaming. Um, and I wonder if you guys have done any kind of partnerships that go into the schools in those communities. They, don't sell, they might not even have the, the resources for even for the bus, uh, but they are the talents there, and they're doing that on their phones in their houses. So sorry, I just got room for like one question, like one answer, yeah. please. So I was just going to say quickly. So part of us and I talked earlier about our ecosystem. You know, the a desire to have such. So for us, it's it's important. Like we're invested in making sure that we provide programming. So we do lots of local activations, uh, and one of the reasons why we sponsored those teams is not only because we want our name associated internationally with those brands. But we also want our community to be exposed to them. And so we bring the top players from NRG actually to do to come to our local activations with our Boys and Girls Clubs or, or any pop-up that we have. And so they are playing with Nairo, pros versus Joes. We, we do it on multiple occasions with all different games. And to us, to speak to your question earlier, that is also how we're going to answer the diversity question. Like, people just aren't exposed. And so they have an opportunity to be exposed for the first time in all the different communities. And we think that will broaden that audience as well. Awesome. So we do have to finish up here. Please give a big round of applause to these amazing panelists, guys.